Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, the session on sleep bruxism. I'd like to thank uh, IDA Malabar and my uh, friends, Dr. Pravish and Dr. Rooney for uh, helping me spread the word of uh, the actual causes of bruxism. Uh, which most of us are unaware of. Uh, so I always take it as my privilege to uh, go around talking about the subject. And uh, in spite of us struggling through this corona uh, scare, uh, we are still learning, uh, which is an amazing thing. So uh, can I start, Unni, Pravish? Yes, uh, yes sir. You're loud and clear. Okay, great. So, uh, and, uh, I... as of now, we have 127 people who have joined in. We have more attendees to join. But I think we, in time we can start, sir. You want me to wait for another five minutes? I'm okay. I'm, I've got nothing much to do. So. Uh, it, it's being <laughs> recorded. And uh, those who have missed some part of it can uh, get it in YouTube later on. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, talking about uh, sleep bruxism, I've uh, been into sleep medicine for the past uh, 10 years now. I did my uh, sleep residency at the uh, Tufts University in, the, in Boston, US. So, uh, the reason why I had to get into it was because uh, after my training in uh, pain, craniofacial pain, I had a lot of patients coming back, almost 20% of them coming back with pain uh, because uh, they were still clenching and grinding. Uh, and unlike what we've been taught, which is 90% uh, of all our uh, clenching and grinding or bruxism is uh, a stress disorder. Unlike that thought, it was kind of a revelation to me when I got to know that it's more to do with the airway and how we dentists can actually help uh, clenching and bruxing with other than just a mouth guard. So that's what we all give, a night guard, right? So I'd like to start my uh, presentation on the that regard. Okay. So bruxism, as we know it, uh, there are several definitions, uh, forcible clenching, grinding of teeth, uh, parafunctional grinding of teeth, uh, in sleep or uh, while awake, uh, involuntary rhythmic, mass spasmodic, non-functional grinding, gnashing, uh, clenching of teeth, leading to occlusive trauma, uh, diurnal, nocturnal. So there are lots of definitions out there. Uh, you know, uh, leading to periodontal tissue uh, lesions, uh, sleep-related movement disorder characterized by grinding, clenching. So these are all the definitions that we've been. A brainwashed into thinking during our dental school days. Uh, I'm not suggesting they're all wrong, but I'm, what I want to say is it's uh, only 10% of it is true. The remaining 90% is airway. It's all airway. And um, that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about the whole thing the whole time today. So it's very difficult for me to uh, you have to understand it's very difficult for me to, uh, you know, compress the whole uh, lecture into just one hour. I've tried my best to make it as simple as possible uh, with maximum research as possible. Uh, if you have any, I, I'm always a guy who uh, likes to be interactive. So if you have any doubts, you can put it, post it on the Q&A section and uh, the moderators would uh, pump it out to me. You can interrupt me at any time you want to. It's it's okay by me. I I actually uh, uh, encourage that more than you know anything else. 
Okay, so getting on. And these are the mechanisms that we have learned. There are neurological factors, uh, there are uh, stimuli, uh, there is uh, psychogenic elements, which is more than anything else that we've learned about medications, uh, uh, toxicity, uh, alcohol, smoking. Daytime wake bruxism is more of a stressful thing. Absolutely, there's no doubt. I'm not refuting that whatsoever. Daytime wake bruxism or clenching is a psychosocial disorder more than anything else. Uh, people have also confused between bruxing and clenching. So when a patient comes to you and uh, you ask them, do you brux or do you clench? So more often than not, they say they don't because you don't hear noises, right? Uh, but, you know, they could either be grinding or they could just be clenching. Clenching noises are hardly heard. So uh, you need to be more, uh, what do you say, inquisitive to understand. And our diagnosis needs to be a, more, a little more precise. Uh, we'll get to that part anyway. But the most important thing are oxygen desaturation events, especially during your sleep. So what is an oxygen desaturation? Uh, we'll get to that when we get to sleep apnea. So why did I get into treating OSA? OSA is obstructive sleep apnea per se. So uh, like I said earlier, when I started practice, it used to be, uh, you know, 80, 20% of the patients coming back with pain. So when I got to know that clenching was still causing a concern, I, I went abroad, I went and got myself educated in sleep apnea. And now, and then 15% got happy. Again, 5% were having a problem. They were having because of neck issues. So I went forward and learned under uh, Rakobado uh, and got to know how to, got in touch with chiropractors and helping patients with that as well. Uh, so it's always a learning curve. You're always trying to learn. You learn new things. Uh, try to incorporate into your protocols and help your patients better. By the way, I uh, am, uh, before I forgot to say that, I know I've been introduced, but got to say this. My practice is 100% uh, CMD, cranial mandibular disorders, cranial cervical mandibular disorders. I don't call it TMD anymore. I'll get to that point again. Uh, and sleep, as well as uh, sports dentistry. So all I look at is pain and sleep. So am I actually treating only just OSA, right? So hardly, because you're a dentist, and especially with me, I'm just doing pain. Out of 100 patients, maybe just four or five come to me with a snoring issue or a sleep or breathing disorder. Uh, so not many patients, I mean, that's a situation in India at least. So people aren't aware uh, enough uh, to be coming to a dentist to get their sleep disorders treated. So since most of my patients are coming to me with pain, the remaining 95%, as part of our diagnostic protocols, we do sleep studies and we check other things and which we will discuss in due time. We get to know that they have a sleep disorder and most of them are clenching and bruxing. And that's when even the patient gets to know. So it's, it's because sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing is not uh, such a hot topic uh, in medical circles in India even now. So it's just getting there. And uh, I really truly believe that we dentists need to be up there, you know, uh, to help uh, these patients. So from a pain specialist purview, is oxygen desaturation more important? Absolutely. We'll be talking about a sleep study and about uh, how we get to know whether the patient is actually clenching or not. Uh, oxygen desaturations, uh, there are research papers that prove they are directly related to, uh, uh, one oxygen desaturation is directly related to a uh, uh, bruxing cycle. I'll show you the physiology behind that. Flow limitations, again, anytime there is a flow limitation in the airway, these are just terms I'm getting you, uh, you know, getting you 
aware of so that you don't have a problem in the future. So flow limitation is when air is not going enough, but it doesn't reach a, a stop breathing episode. So that will also cause hypoxia. So both of these finally lead to hypoxia where there's not enough oxygen in your body. And hence, bruxism. Really, this is what you're going to know today. It's not just a, a psychological problem. So, all we've learned our lives, sleep bruxism. Is it just a parafunctional habit? Our first response, <laughs> when you see a patient with totally atroid deep, woohoo! Full mouth rehabilitation, 28 units ceramic full mouth, wow. And you give them a night down, right? You have to understand that we have to get to the cause of all that attrition in the first place. Why? Why did all those teeth get atrided in the first place? You would say bruxing and grinding. Okay. So you do your entire uh, work, the rehab, and you give the patient a night guard. That night guard is actually only just protecting your teeth or your work from further deterioration. It's not stopping the sleep apnea per se. The patient will continue to brux. Why? Because 90% of those cases are bruxing because of an oxygen desaturation event. Remember, so if you see this money coming in now, you better make sure that a night guard isn't enough after the rehab. You gave him a sleep appliance. And that too, not at any bite. I'll get to that as well. Okay, so is bruxism just a psychosocial disorder? I guess not. Not guess not, I believe not. Not just believe not, I know not. <laughs> and by the end of the session, I hope you guys would know that too. So could bruxism be, be actually a physiological response to keep the person alive? Yes. Does sleep bruxism have anything to do with TMD or CMD? Now patients come up with pain and the first thing we, facial pain or headaches or something, and the first thing we say is, oh, the patient has TMD. I mean, we are not taught how to uh, diagnose TMDs, how to help these patients. Max, we would refer them to a radiologist or a surgeon who would uh, give injections or arthrocentesis arthro or some sort of a invasive process when actually it would just be an occlusion. Since uh, the subject of pain doesn't fall into the gamut of uh, today's lecture, I'm not going to go deep into it, but what I would like to stress is most of my patients that I see now, I believe their TNJs are perfectly fine. Okay, But they have an occlusal disorder that is leading to muscle tensions, leading to pain on all over the head, not just the orofacial part, including the cranium, including the cervical area. So we need to know more about the muscles. And this is why uh, when we are in dental school, we are taught about the anatomy. We always wondered why the hell are we taught, you know, about muscles of the neck and uh, physiology, which we are not even involved in. So this is the reason, because you need to know. Uh, unfortunately, uh, First year, we write the exam. I tell this in all my lectures. We write the exam, we pass, we forget it. Second year, the same thing. Third year, the same thing. It's only the final year subjects that we keep in our mind for the rest of our lives. And we become such tooth-centric doctors that we forget everything else that's surrounding it. And that's how we end up with CMD. I wouldn't say TMD again. CMD. Okay? Again, because it doesn't fall in today's gamut, so I'm going across. Do oxygen desaturations during sleep leading to obstructive sleep apnea have any relation to sleep bruxism? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So what is sleep? The uh, anagram says stress, level, elimination, exercise, plan. So again, that is because of uh, our brainwashing during us dental school days, citing the, ex, uh, the example of stress, the cause of stress. So I'd like to get into sleep. 
So are these guys really stressed? I always show these photographs. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, our uh, elected representatives. They're all stressed out, maybe, uh, from partying too much late night. Uh, we have an example just next to it. So uh, not much is happening at our uh, parliamentary houses. So uh, we even have our ex-prime minister sleeping in front of the uh, Malaysian prime minister. Uh, we have our favorite uh, Raga, uh, <laughs> who's doing the same thing. Uh, I'm, I'm apolitical, by the way, so please don't uh, start a grudge against me for this. It's very scary out there in India right now. So, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Kleitman, he's been deemed as the pioneer of uh, sleep medicine. Uh, but I'd like you to remember Christian Gilmanon. Uh, he actually just passed away uh, last year. Uh, I had the uh, fortune of uh, hearing him lecture while at Harvard. Uh, amazing guy. Almost every uh, paper scientific research article out there, every paper out of three would have his name on it. So he's an amazing guy. He did a lot for dental sleep medicine. So what is obstructive sleep apnea? There are a variety of obstructions that can cause sleep apnea. It's in the, it's in the term itself, obstructive sleep apnea. So something is causing an obstruction in your airway during sleep that leads to an apneic uh, event. Now what's an apnea? So you have an apnea, you have a hypopnea, uh, and you have oxygen desaturation. These are the three things I would normally concentrate on while checking a patient with sleep apnea or with bruxism per se. But first, let me talk about sleep apnea. So an apnea is where a patient can't breathe for more than, just as an example, for more than 20 to, around 20 to 30 seconds. And hypopnea is where between 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, a desaturation is when, because of the blockage in the airway, there's not enough oxygen getting into your body, and hence the oxygen limit, the oxygen level within your body goes down below 97 or 95%. So every time that event happens, there is a clench. We'll show you why. So uh, this is what more often than not causes a sleep apnea event, a constricted airway. Uh, we go through a detailed diagnostic protocol. I'll uh, show you that as well. So this would, this is when the patient is standing up. Imagine this, a patient standing up has such a thin airway, narrow airway. When this is the base of the tongue, it's supposed to be at least here. This area would be around 10 to 15 millimeters square and uh, in area, circumferential area. It's supposed to be at least 150. So uh, when this patient is standing up and awake, if it's only 20, if he's going to lie down because of gravity and neck fat and a lot of other stuff, that airway is going to get compressed even more. Okay, And we have a, a video that would show exactly what's happening. So you can see how airway, how you can see how the oxygen is getting in through the airway here. And if there is a posteriorly placed mandible like in class two cases, or if there's a big tongue, what happens is since the tongue is attached to the genior tubercles, the tongue falls back when the mandible falls back and there's an airway block. Now this airway block would lead to lack of oxygen in the body, as well as an increase of carbon dioxide because if the airway block is there, the carbon dioxide also doesn't go out. And you should also remember that the heart is now pumping faster because it needs to get every millimeter cubed of oxygen possible to spread across the body so that cell repair happens. And again, there is heart muscle, you know, uh, developing, getting hypertrophic, cardiomegaly. 10, 15 years of uh, chronic sleep apnea, snoring would lead to cardiac attacks. So these are all scary things. Uh, people dying, uh, healthy people dying while exercising actually. 
uh, who are very lean and thin marathon runners. I've had a friend, that's why I'm being very specific here. Uh, he's, he used to snore, so uh, never knew about it, never took it seriously. We in India, or even in Asia, we don't take uh, patient, we don't take snoring seriously. I, on the contrary, we take it as a joke. So we need to be aware of all of this. And because the heart is getting tired, uh, you also feel a lot of, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, palpitations and uh, dyspnea when trying to do something tough like climbing stairs or uh, doing hard work. Uh, so all these are common symptoms in a sleep apnea patient. And whenever this happens, this block happens, and because of the desaturation event, basically the hypothalamus, the awakening center, recognizes this, it tells the tongue to go forward. As it goes forward, it pulls the jaw along with it and the patient clenches. Now these clenching forces are really, really huge. Uh, as an example, when I talk to patients, when, you, uh, when we normally uh, throw a ball, we exert like 75 to 80 microvolts of muscle force. When we chew food, it's around 150 to 200. Uh, when we clench in the daytime, it's around 250 to 300. But when you grind at night, those forces are almost 750 to 800, almost three to four times. And we have proof of this. And we actually record these. So I'll show you how these are involved. And think about it, at these huge muscle forces, what would happen? The first thing that would get destroyed are the teeth, right? At these high forces, the teeth are the strongest, the enamel is the strongest material in the body. At such high forces, it's natural that the enamel would start wearing away, not just from the occlusal side, but also from the, uh, from the uh, cementic, cementic enamel junction. Why? Because that's where the enamel is the thinnest. So you see a lot of ab fractions, and they are not toothbrush abrasions. I've still heard patients telling a doctor told them it is toothbrush. No, they are mainly caused due to clenching at night. Do a sleep study for those patients. Even if you do a filling on those, you would see after two years those fillings coming out. It's not because of toothbrushes, because they're continuing to clench and grind. Remember, those patients don't, they're not going to uh, be helped at all with a mouth guard. They need a sleep appliance. Okay. So, 60% of all deaths during sleep are MI related, and 80% of all those MI are caused due to untreated and undiagnosed OSA. So think about how important our jobs are, okay, as a dentist in treating sleep apnea. So uh, when I came back to India uh, around 10 years ago, we, uh, there was no guiding lights because no one doing this, so I had to come up uh, with a protocol and uh, our centers known as the right bite. So we have uh, uh, three centers and I'm a consultant of the two centers. So I use the same protocols wherever I work. Uh, these protocols, they keep uh, adding on because you keep learning new things. Uh, for example, uh, the usual stuff, the questionnaire, radiology, TMJ muscle palpation, the cervical rotation, cranial nerve screening, the heart rate voltage, the capnography, they're all new things that I've added in because you keep learning new stuff. Uh, but every time I do uh, 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 help a patient with sleep apnea or boxing, uh, they have to undergo a sleep study and an ENT consult. Because as we saw in the first slide, it's not just the tongue. There are other blockages like the uh, adenoids or the tonsils or other lymphoid tissues, which we will see in due time. So these are the diagnostic protocols for sleep per se. Radiology and airway volumetry, stop bank questionnaire, the clinical diagnosis, postural exam, and sleep side. So radiology. Uh, first thing, the most basic thing, right? Lateral cephalogram. Because most of the, some places when I started out in the beginning, not all areas have uh, the fortune to work with uh, full volume uh, CBCT unit. So uh, you need to make do as well. So you can see how uh, the airway is patent here. There's enough space, but here there are multiple occlusions. So this patient is bound to have sleep apnea issues more than them. Just as an example, you can see also uh, the lymphoid tissue formation here, which is basically adenoid. 
these formations here. Uh, OBG, we are looking for, uh, sometimes we do see these carotid artery thickenings very rarely. Uh, again, they are a signal for cardiac problems, but more often than not, I'm looking at these mesetric notches, how deep they are. Why are they deep? Form follows function. If a patient continues to clench, there is going to be the mesito pull. And as these pulls increase, you would see uh, a change in shape of the uh, posterior border of the mandible. So, I mean, on the lower border of the mandible, and that notch becomes deeper and deeper. It's all common sense. And my favorite, the airway volumetry. So we are looking at uh, the airway volume. Uh, anything that comes in the red zone, which is less than uh, 150 millimeter square, is dangerous. Uh, some people go for airway volume, but I would prefer to look at uh, the uh, thinnest, the narrowest area of uh, space because that would form, that would be more dangerous to the patient because that's, this is when the patient is awake and standing up. If the patient lies down, it's going to be enormous. That place is going to get closed anyway, in spite of whatever the volume is, right? So I go by the minimum area. So you can see how this patient is having, uh, what's the minimum area? 70 millimeter square. And uh, this is post-treatment, non-surgical, just with the DNA appliance. One of the appliances that we use, uh, it has almost more than doubled. So amazing appliances. We have all these appliances coming into India right now. Uh, we have, uh, again, superimposition. Uh, this is a patient, the inner circle you can see uh, is uh, 354 and once the patient wore a sleep appliance, which is the outer circle, it's almost doubled. So you can superimpose. So those are the uh, radiology that we depend on. Uh, and now we go for the uh, stop bang questionnaire. The stop bang is actually uh, snoring, uh, tired, excessive daytime sleepness. So some people say they're always sleeping. It's not good. Uh, the reason why they're always sleeping is because they're not getting quality sleep during the night. So sleep is divided into normal and deep, which is uh, NREM and uh, REM sleep. So uh, at least 25% of your total sleep should be REM sleep, okay, deep sleep. If not, if you have these oxygen desaturations, if you have these apnea events, you keep your sleep, so you're in normal sleep, you're trying to go into deep sleep, whoa, desaturation. So you're awake again. You don't wake up per se, but maybe you would have tossed and turned around or you would have kicked or you would have moved your legs or you would have, uh, what do you say, just clenched, for example. So every time that happens, your sleep is getting broken. And that is going to show in your working uh, qual work quality the next day. So as this goes on and on and on, you get more and more uh, mentally diluted because it is going to affect your work lifestyle. So oft awakenings, uh, blood pressure is going to be varying. More often than not, it's going to be less than normal. You have the exertional dyspnea, then higher the BMI, higher the age, bigger the neck circumference. So we do ask these patients to go on a diet. We give them a diet actually uh, to make sure they bring down their weight. A BMI should be less than 27 at least. Gender, they say male, but I've seen more female patients than male patients, maybe because in India, <laughs> we, I sound harsh, but we be more like more number of male chauvinistic pigs, so we don't we say we don't, we don't fall sick, so <laughs> more than anything else. Anyway, uh, then we have postural examination. We're looking at facial asymmetry. We're looking at uh, whether right side or left side. Suppose the clenching is more on the right side, then you'd see a, a thicker right side muscle asymmetry on that side. Uh, facial rotation how the face is rotated, uh, going with the bending, eye line, going with the bending. Uh, DNS is uh, what you look at the nose, we'll get to that part. Uh, looking at the shoulder droop, because if there's a change here, to accommodate that, to compensate for that, the shoulder is going to droop, the hip would change position, the feet would change position, and we look at all of that. And correct as well. So if you're looking at airway and posture, uh, 
I don't know if you've noticed, you'd see people uh, with a forward head posture. The main reason, the two main reasons are one, the digital media that we use, the computer or the mobile, uh, the cell phones, as they call in the US. Uh, so the head posture slowly comes forward, but there's a huge population that ends up because the airway is small, the body itself is asking the head to move forward so that the airway opens up. As you can see in this figure, the body is actually virtually telling the uh, uh, jaw to go forward and the head to go forward so that the airway opens up. And you have uh, this, face, this, face, this kind of a face for uh, most of these patients, mouth breathers, uh, kids who have tonsils and adenoids. Uh, when we get to that, I'll explain that. Very famous guy out there. Most of these famous guys, they uh, maybe under the influence, they all have a forward head posture. They consider it cool. The way they uh, stoop and drag their feet when they walk, none of them are erect. It's because of a uh, airway issue. So every inch of that head being forward, every inch of that head being forward, it's almost 20 kilos in weight. It's a relative number, it's not actually weighing. So that amount of uh, weight would naturally end up with uh, cervical rotations, that much pressure on the neck, and you'd end up with more neck pains and muscle issues. Uh, again, uh, how a baby, uh, there's, there's an airway compression and how we use our hand or towels to flex the neck so that the airway space increases. And most of these kids, they are clenching and boxing. So we also use a posture grid. Uh, it's a mobile application or cell phone application that we have. It's free actually. So we do all of these on our patients. Uh, once we give the orthotic and the sleep appliance to the patient still doesn't recover properly, we send them to a chiropractor. We don't have any new chiropractors in India, unfortunately. But we do have a couple of chiropractors in uh, Bangalore, wherever we work at least, in Bangalore, uh, Mumbai, and Delhi. Uh, but uh, since they're not in-house, we try. I try to incorporate Dr. Mariana Dr. Badu's distraction techniques. All of these are taught at our uh, courses, so if you're seriously interested, please join in. Uh, we do a cranial nerve screening to shoot before we shoot bite, before we treat the patient. Uh, you know, we go look at oral tissues and everything. And I don't know how many of you have noticed there would be a, a turned uh, uvula, okay? It could be the right, it could be the left, something new that I've learned. If the uvula is not in position, that means the uvula is a, a, a diagnostic uh, tool to locate how the, to identify how the cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus functioning. All we need to do is get that vagus functioning again before you shoot the pipe. Believe it or not, it's just using a long QT and tickle the uvula. In two to three weeks, that vagus is functioning properly. So uh, we'll be talking about how the vagus functions as well. Oh God, I'm really slow. Whoopsie, I've got to speed up. So we have clinical examination. The first thing we look at is uh, the uh, Malampadi classification. Malampadi is an Indian doctor from Andhra. He's a Telugu. Uh, Dr. Friedman joined along with him, and they classified the uh, oral space into one, two, three, four Malampadi classifications. So, if it's three and four where you can't see the uvula at all, all the tonsils, but mainly the uvula, then that patient is bound to have a desaturation event because there's not enough oxygen going in. Uh, as an example, you can see how this patient's airway is totally compressed. Why? Uh, one of the major reasons that I've seen in some of these patients are uh, faulty uh, orthodontics or prosthodontics uh, where the pipe has been not properly maintained. Uh, so this patient has undergone an orthodontic process wherein uh, four uh, premolars are extracted to make the smile look good. Unfortunately, they've also been given a fixed, they had also been given a fixed retention to maintain the smile. So the, fixed, the whole process of fixed, the whole idea of giving a fixed retention is so that the smile doesn't get bad again. But unfortunately, there are other structures that are getting compensated and compromised for. 
and that patient ends up with pain. So we need to be very aware. So take care of the airway issue before you get into finishing the case orthodontically. So uh, we had to remove the fixed retention the first thing. So uh, you can see the lateral scallop tongue. So since the space is reduced, the tongue is wanting to go forward, but it just doesn't. So the tongue keep pushing. And these are actually the uh, impressions of the teeth falling on the tongue. Uh, you see a Malampati four, five, six. <laughs> you hardly see the airway out there. You can see the bicuspid drop off because this patient has ended up as a deep bite after orthodontic. So, and ab fraction. So these are the toothbrush abrasions that most of these doctors are prescribing to. So, I would say no. Please don't say that. These, if you see these, then uh, please do a sleep study and confirm for sleep apnea or related bruxism. Lingual frenum. So again, a high lingual attachment or a high uh, labial attachment again would lead to faulty tongue posturing, uh, high palate formations. If the palate is high. I think, yeah, so uh, adenoid and tonsils, well, let me, yeah, one second, yeah, okay. We'll get back to the, uh, the lingual tie a little later. So every time I send a patient to uh, an ENT, uh, I need clearance for the tonsils because they all need to go. We as parents and even our uh, colleagues, our ENT colleagues are always pretty wary to get those tonsils off to undergo a surgical procedure. But if it is required, yes, it has to be removed. Don't expect it to just regress on its own. If the patient is suffering, they have to be removed. Uh, all our ENTs think in those terms, so our patients are pretty much escaping from all those problems. But because you're in touch with these ENTs, you get these amazing images. This is the epiglottis, actually. So in this case, you could see how uh, the patient is while sitting. Here you can see how the patient is while lying down. So this is the airway, how the airway gets compressed and the epiglottis moves posteriorly. And this is with the uh, sleep appliance while lying down. So amazing images. I just wanted to show you an image. This is how much the airway gets compressed. So if this is how the tonsils are going to be, and those are the adenoids up there, and if the tongue goes back while the patient, while the kid sleeps, he is going to have those desaturations, right? And those desaturations would end up with the patient clenching, broxing, as well as, have you heard of ADHD? ADHD is attention deficit hyperactive disorder. So these patients are, uh, most of these patients who have ADHD in the West, they used to be given a lot of Vitalin, and now the whole uh, concept of ADHD uh, medication has changed to airway. ADHD is actually just another term for uh, sleep apnea, uh, sleep disordered breathing, uh, or even UARS. The first line of treatment now is adenotonsillectomy. So make sure if your kids have ADHD, take them to an ENT and get those uh, lymphoid tissues off. Uh, another case, you can see the generalized attrition, abfraction, malampati, high ash palate. But this is what I want to show you guys the lingual tori. So this is a new thing that Dr. Dave Singh, after I attended his course in Korea on the DNA appliance, uh, I've understood how uh, clenching and broxing could lead to formation of tori. Even if they undergo a surgical process to remove those, they might come up again. Why? Because they're still clenching. So what is the relationship? Most of my patients, if they have, I look for tori. So, uh, uh, as an example, I don't have enough time, but I'll just uh, cite you that example. I happened to lecture at an ENT conference, and an ENT came up and said, uh, "We don't look. You don't look into the mouth. You just look at uh, the oral cavity. I mean, we don't even look at the oral cavity. All we do is the malam party. We don't look at teeth. So, uh, but when I looked into his mouth, well, he had this huge tori and asked him to do a sleep study. And our sleep study proved that he clenches like crazy, and he knows he clenches, but he never knew he did, and he didn't know those were related." So it's all about uh, observation and uh, diagnosis. So form follows function. So during parafunctional activities, lateral pterygoid stretches the osteogenic perichondrium. So if a muscle is working extra, for example, uh, the lateral pterygoid is basically, uh, the superior head of the lateral pterygoid basically forms the uh, articular disc. So 
If you continue to clench and grind at such high forces throughout the night, uh, that lateral guard is going to shorten. As it shortens, it pulls the disc forward and along with the disc, part of the, peri the, the perichondrum and the uh, bone changes shape. You might have heard of beaking of the condyle. The beaking of the condyle is nothing but a simple change in shape of the uh, condyle due to these excessive forces. Same thing with the uh, mesita knot that we were talking about. So the physiology, the most important, you guys need to understand this. So this is the periosteal uh, stretch hypothesis. So for example, heavy forces at short duration, for example, while chewing, that's not going to lead to any changes in periodontium or tooth movement. But during parafunctional activities, both the maxilla and mandible undergo more forces, resulting in bone deformation. Okay, so these bone, this bone changes, this addition of bone is actually a protective mechanism from so that the bone doesn't fracture during these forces. So both bruxing and the tori and the tori are actually saving the human body from deteriorating. First death and break it. So it's as simple as that. Open up your mind and think. So this is the brain oxygenation and tooth relationship. Uh, the hypercapnia is detected by the uh, aortic and carotid bodies in your, uh, on your uh, arteries. To maintain the airway, there is neuromuscular accommodation all over the head and neck area. The bone remodels in response to this change in posture. And if there is a change in dental position, the maximum intercuspation, MIP is interproximation or intercuspate doesn't matter. That is going to prevent this optimal positioning and the patient starts clenching and grinding. So let us get to why this happens, these first two points. It's going to be the physiology. First year physiology, like I said, first year anatomy, first year physiology, you got to relearn. So flow limitations and oxygen desaturations play havoc with the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenaline axis, and the trigeminal cardiac reflex, okay? So just understand this slide, very important slide. There's oxygen desaturation, meaning oxygen going below 97%. Then there is hypoxia. Because there's an oxygen there's saturation, there's not enough oxygen in the human body. Now, this leads to an increase in arterial carbon dioxide, which is a hypercapnia, increase in carbon dioxide. That would lead to a tachycardia, which is increase in beat. Why? To get in more oxygen, right? The heart is beating faster. Tachycardia leads to RMMA stimulation. What is RMMA stimulation? It is rhythmic masticatory muscle activity. Rhythmic masticatory muscle activity. Basically, your masticatory muscles are increasing their action so that uh, there is more breathing and oxygenation happening to counter the increased hypercapnia. Understand? Now, this stimulation would end up with a bruxin. Oops, there's a W there. I'm sorry for that spelling mistake. So, unfortunately, these RMMA stimulations are not measuring how strongly the muscles are actually clenching. We will get to that later, okay? Just understand this for the time being. Increase in arterial in hypercapnia leads to the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, increase in catecholamine release, which, increase, which activates the hypothalamic pituitary axis, adrenal axis, okay? And that also leads to the activation of the TCR, which then goes again to tachycardia and bruxism. So another way, another method of bruxism is when there is an increase in catecholamines, there is a hormonal dysfunction that's an imbalance that's happening. To get rid of these as well, the body uh, responds with bruxism. So these are the uh, four ways with which you end up with bruxism. And these are all proven through research papers. Yeah, so that's the next page. So uh, 
it's mainly Levine and, like I said, Levine and uh, Jilmanov who have brought out most of these uh, research papers is uh, all coming from, uh, you know, undoubtedly. So again, everything comes back to, is there proof of this? There is proof. But unfortunately, we are not looking for these. That's the sad part. So, now we need to know how many times they are clenching and grinding, right? We need to know how many times and we need to quantify. Just asking the patient is not enough because the patient doesn't know. They're going to sleep, right? So you need to quantify. So we do a sleep study. All these patients undergo a sleep study. So there are three ways of doing a sleep study, okay? One is a polysomnograph, which is done at hospitals. It's the, it's the most ultimate way of recording sleep. But if you need to record sleep, a patient has to sleep. And with all those wires on your body, can you even sleep? It's virtually impossible, right? So we normally resort to a home sleep test, okay? Uh, with home sleep tests, however, you cannot measure the RMME activity. The home sleep test basically tells you, shows you oxygen desaturations. We'll get to that. But what we do right now is use the Gempro Bruxism uh, apnea monitors. Okay? So this is what a normal sleep report would look like. They would show you the AHI index and the respiratory index. Oopsie, I'm going to be on time. So the AHI index is the number of apneas plus the number of hypopneas divided by the number of times you sleep. So number of hours you sleep. It should ideally be less than five. You can see the patient here is almost 21. So that means every hour, 21 times, this guy isn't breathing for almost like uh, 20 or 10, 15 minutes. He's not breathing at all. Okay. Now, this is what normally ENTs would look at. But because I'm more into pain, this is what I would look at. If you don't have a gem pro study with you, you go by desaturations and flow limitations. Okay. Both of these need to be below five. So what have we learned so far? If there are 89 desaturations in accordance, there are 89 clenching cycles. If there are 69 uh, flow limitations, there are 69 clenching cycles. Not 100% not proof because uh, we are not actually recording the muscle force. So that's the problem with these uh, uh, sleep studies, even the polysomnograph, the one you do in the hospital, where they do connect to the mentalis and the masticatory muscle, the only a way that we would know is as a spike, but that spike can be even uh, just a jaw change position or jaw movement. So uh, you're not actually measuring it. It can be any sort of jaw movement. And that's why we do the GEMPRO BioBrux reports. So we hear with these studies, we can actually relate the oxygen desaturations to the to the uh, Bruxin forces. So here you can see. So we do a baseline uh, clenching uh, report to know how how much force is actually being applied. It's almost 370 newton microvolts, and the patient is clenching at 1138 microvolts at night because of desaturation. So. These would always relate to a desaturation events here. So we always look at number of times, which is 25% more than this. So this guy is almost clenching uh, 300 times. So, wow. Uh, no wonder those tori formations, right? Okay. So how do we treat our patients? We need a guideline. So this is how we have, I have created a guideline for our patients. If the AHI, because not everyone has a gem pro study, so if the AHI is below uh, 25, all appliances are good enough. If it's 25 to 50, CPAP. I would not give them all appliances unless the patient is ready to try because uh, CPAP is difficult to wear. 50 plus is CPAP, oral surgery, oh, I mean, oral appliances with or without surgery. 85 and above, I don't even know how they're alive. <laughs> Basically, they are like zombies, okay? Uh, uh, they, they need treatment immediately. They could die any time. So this is what a CPAP does. You would see uh, patients walking around with a box. It's like a, 
uh, a ventilator unit. It pushes oxygen through the no uh, nose or some even with the mouth so that the uh, tongue is pushed forward and the airway remains open. Uh, appliances, what it does, it takes the support of the maxilla to keep the jaw forward. Now, there are several appliances out there, there are hundreds of types of appliances out there. Which one do we select? Tongue retaining devices, fixed orthotic appliances, adjustable MADS, MADS are mandible advancement devices, the CPAP Pro, etc. Okay, hundreds of them. Which one do we select? What could be the most important factor? It's all about the bite registration. I don't give a damn, sorry about my language. I don't give a damn about what appliance you're using. It doesn't matter. You can make your own stuff as well, okay? It's all about the bite registration. I have just seen a research paper that shows how bad uh, oral appliances, sleep appliances are uh, for the TMJ and uh, craniofacial pain. Why? Because you are forcing the bite into 70% maximum protrusion. I even heard inside sources from the lab say that some doctors just provide the models, not even a bite, and the lab just creates a position. Oh my God, you'd rather not do anything for that patient. How can everyone have 70% maximum protrusion? Everyone, it's impossible. It has to be muscle specific, custom made for that specific patient. Seriously, are you out of your goddamn mind? It's so irritating to see this happen. So we came up with the TENS protocol, which is the right by TENS protocol, and you also have the more sophisticated K7 protocol. So in short, we use an ALF, uh, it's not just any TENS unit, we use a J5 ultra low frequency unit, or uh, even a bioresearch uh, quarter TENS 2 unit. The difference between uh, this unit and the locally available units are uh, these four causes. First of all, they are ultra low frequency, two to four hertz. Antidromic, they go straight to the nerve instead of to the muscle. So all the muscles supplied by that nerve is uh, being relaxed. They are bilaterally simultaneous. So people say I use two uh, tens units on both sides. Impossible. You can never do it together. Uh, and at precisely 1.4 for 1.5 seconds, because that's when the muscles reach the, uh, the best uh, 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 myofibro length for proper firing. So, uh, and this is the only, these are the only uh, uh, TENS units out there that uh, are patented for all four together. So you would never get any other TENS unit, which is why people say when they, have, when they say, I use a TENS unit, no. If it's not these, you're not doing it right, simple. So this means that instead of a single muscle getting twitched, all the muscles by the nerve are getting pulsed, and not just the facial, the neck as well. I'll show you how. So we place a tense electrode in such a point which, which is in front of the uh, tragus uh, on the mandible or not. So you have direct access to the uh, facial nerve and the more deeper uh, mandibular nerve. And we also target the uh, spinal accessory so now we have access to 95% of the muscles of the head and the neck because we are looking for airway, which is not just a neck thing and a head, or a head thing, it's both together. So you need to relax, so it's a group action, all muscles together. So using just the J5, we find out where the jaw has to be with reciprocal forces. Uh, it's uh, known as, uh, muscle awakening test, so we need to, we do a lot of tests to find out where the jaw actually has to be. So this is the basic uh, thing that we do with just a TENS unit. Uh, we find the bite, we record the bite, and then we give it to the lab. Uh, if you're going a little more, uh, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated, we use the K7 myokinesiography, which is going to be 99% precise we know at which jaw position exactly how the muscles are. Excuse me, sir. So, yep. So can we just go back to the muscle slide? Uh, one of the attendees is telling that you're going a bit fast. I have to, right? You just gave me one hour. <laughs> no, you, have, you, have, you can take more time. Oh, great. Okay. So okay. what is the question here? No, they wanted to see the muscle slide. 
Yes. Which muscle? This one. I think uh, this one. Yeah. Okay. So and the uh, next slide also. Yeah. So uh, how to position these? Uh, these are basically uh, on the junction of the uh, top, uh, the upper third, and the middle third triangles of the uh, anterior triangle of I mean, the posterior triangle of the uh, neck. We've learned anterior triangle, posterior triangles. Uh, again, posterior anatomy. So uh, right behind there is where the spinal accessory come out. So the spinal accessory joins hands with the uh, cervical plexus and supplies the traps, uh, the capitals, the rectus posterior, uh, posterior major, minor, all these muscles. So we, we teach all of this in detail at our conference, I mean, at our courses. So uh, because of a time limit duration, I can't teach everything here. But it's all about anatomy. And these are what the facial and the mandibular nerves help us with. So when you are recording the bite, you want to make sure all the muscles are at relaxed position. And when we give a reciprocating force on the arm, we find out where exactly the jaw has to be. Uh, I think I'll just go back to Iman. Okay. Sorry for that. Okay, I think I've got some more time. Uh, so people look at midline, not dental. We need to look at femoral midline because dental could be anywhere. It does. It's not the actual thing to go by. You need to go by the femoral midline always. Uh, so to get more uh, precise, we use the K7 or the uh, BioPack. Anyone to find out where exactly the jaw has to be. At each point, we know what the muscle readings are. So we would select the point at which the muscles are the most relaxed and most towards the center. So in this case, I would select the 1.1s, which would be number seven. I mean, sorry, there is a 1.0, which is number three. Yep, number three is there. It is almost in the center. So, yep, and it's forward enough. So I would go for number three. And that's how we would select. And we can go in live mode, shoot the bite with the patient in that position. That's how precise it is. And then we record the bite and we provide the uh, sleep appliance. So, uh, sir, uh, sir, can you yeah. can you just tell something about recording the bite? Because one of the attendees had asked that, how to record the bite. Uh, how to record the bite? Okay. Uh, so, no, uh, there no, are two ways of recording. How do you prefer to record it, I believe? Yeah, so there are two ways of recording the bite. It's either with uh, using just the uh, TENS unit, or if you can afford the entire K7 muscle reading unit. So with the J5, uh, we are only 70% precise, okay? Like I said, how, we, how people normally take the bite for sleep appliances, 70% maximum protrusion. How precise are we there? Zero. Okay, we're just going for arbitrary positions. Uh, there's a 50% chance of it be becoming right. Okay, but because you're forcing a jaw position to be in uh, where the jaw is not happy with, because the muscles have to reciprocate. Think about wearing an appliance all night to keep the area open in a forward position where the patient is not happy yet. So you need to relax those muscles, check if the muscles are relaxed enough, and then find out where the jaw position has to be. How exactly to record the jaw, uh, the, uh, the uh, bite is we virtually mark lines on this bite rim and we ask the person, once the muscles are relaxed, we ask the person in the myo trajectory to find out where the jaw would elicit the best reciprocal force on your arm. Now, this bite is only 70% precise, but it is 70% better, 70% better, absolutely, no doubt, than the 70% maximum protrusion, which is totally arbitrary. So, how much do we have to open the jaw to? What about the yaw pitch and roll? What about the 3D positioning? You're not, you're, you're not even bothered about those. So, unfortunately, that's what we all have been taught to do, and that's what we are doing. So, I'm just trying to tell you that 
there is something else out there which with which you can be a little more precise and more patient specific a little more customized um you don't have to force the jaw into a specific so, position so sir do we generally uh, use a 70% protrusion bite no never no, i no, never I'm asking, use a, yeah, yeah. that's the uh, conventional way i know yeah so and, that's a conventional uh, way which is not right because yes it and does, this one be the allows same us to record the muscle muscle happy bite exactly okay. for that person for that human being where the muscles are happy that's where you want to record the bite and Not and that should be near to perfect for that person isn't it sir exactly it, uh with just the tens unit that's the right word to use with just the tens unit near to perfect if okay. you have the emgs and the jaw tracker as well if you can spend a little more money <laughs> it emotionally comes to that so uh if you don't have a ct what do you do uh if you don't even have a uh, an opg what do you do right so it all depends as to what you know what you can do people say I, oh you got to buy this equipment that equipment no one second let me just finish this you yes, say got to buy this equipment that equipment no it's not that way suppose you are doing a laser course or suppose you are doing uh, an endo course or suppose you are doing uh, an implant course you do have to invest on equipment it's it's uh, well, common sense right so here the first equipment you invest on would be a tens unit and if you have the tens you can at least start doing the right thing instead of uh, going for arbitrary points yeah sorry unni please ask unni uh, or is it pravish Who yeah i it was, it was pravish so oh, okay, pravish, uh, and uh, any specific agent which you use for recording the bite agent uh, unni agent like uh, a oh, material material yeah oh no okay so uh, well i used to use the blue moose till it was available in india uh but then like i said uh due to uh, uh the indian economics now for example uh in the us these patients are charged 7000 to 10000 dollars okay and that's where i came from and when i started practicing in india and i used to charge 3 4 lakhs i hardly was getting a patient i'm talking about 2009 10 over the years i've learned to be very india specific so our protocols we uh, teach how to be a little indian with these uh, methods so frankly speaking i use uh, putty i use putty and uh, but right now uh, we are in the process of incorporating uh, the uh, uh, infraoral scanners so they are amazing because of the shelf life of putty now we have better stuff with infraoral scanners so if you have an intra scanner amazing work so right now we are doing that we scan our products to the lab uh, which is the uh, the right by durant lab and uh, we get them immediately in like two or three days earlier to say 20 days now it takes just 3 or 4 days so 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 it is like you get the muscle in proper position and you can record it with any conventional method isn't it sir yes exactly anything you can use anything you want but i would suggest uh, putty more than wax because Uh, or or even uh, aloe wax aloe wax is strong enough but not just simple wax that's not be that cheap <laughs> but putty would give you an almost uh, good enough reading uh, so would you like to continue or take more questions so another question uh, has come uh, regarding this okay regarding so wait listen there are just uh, i think four or five more slides so can i just finish them uh, sure, yes sir, sure, sir. Sure. okay we can finish it Okay so these are the appliances that we provide so these appliances are again just temporary what is the actual problem why are these patients actually having a problem right most of them would be a malformed occlusion um uh, malformed bones uh constricted arches uh a nasal deviation another very good example nasal deviations deviated nasal septums these patients would go to an ent get those dns corrected and you know they just relapse again why are they relapsing have you thought about it it's because we are directly involved if the arch shape is high okay you should remember that the palatal arch is directly connected to the nasal septum so if the arch is high the septum is going to get bent every time they try to correct it with without the arch getting corrected it is going to get bent again logic common sense please 
we send our deviated nasal septum patients only, I mean, to the ENT only post corrections, post uh, expansion. So we use a lot of appliances for expansion, uh, the DNA, the agar, uh, control large orthodontics, alpha appliances. So these are the DNA appliances. So uh, most of these appliances are not available in India. Uh, what I've been trying to do is start these things going in India. Uh, the reason, again, most of these appliances are, you know, developed in the developed world and they are patented, so they are very expensive. Uh, now, these guys are approaching us to, because they've seen the market of, you know, South Asia. So, our lab has now got the rights to form these, to, to construct, manufacture, fabricate these appliances for a zero less. So, what used to cost $2,000 are now just going to cost $200. So, uh, and we are, and all of these appliances are going to be, uh, what do you say, uh, introduced uh, at our conference. We were supposed to do the conference in March. I'll talk about the conference in a couple of slides. So these are a few of the appliances. So the DNA appliance is a uh, 3D expansion appliance which increases the airway of even adults. Okay? Remember this, of even adults by up to 200, 250 percentage. Believe it or not. The mRNA is an appliance that is worn along with the DNA as a sleep appliance. Again, on the neuromuscular bite. Let's not go for arbitrary bites. Then we have the alpha appliances, which are mainly used in deciduous Sir, could patients. You just, could you just tell us what uh, DNA stands for, mRNA stands for? <laughs> DNA is uh, the day night appliance. And the oh, okay. And the mRNA is a midnight removal night appliance. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, so, that's more <laughs> sensible because yeah, the DNA and mRNA, which we know, are different. Uh, but actually, uh, the, uh, the inventor, Dr. Dave Singh, uh, he has shown how uh, these appliances actually. So, the functioning of these appliances, again, which we could teach you, it, that, this alone took me like five days to learn. So, I can't teach it in a one hour uh, session here. So, these appliances are. Uh, patented because they have specific uh, springs on the palatal side of it that engages the ruge, which then uh, uh, changes the uh, DNA pattern. Uh, I don't know how much I've, uh, you have heard about uh, changing the uh, DNA patterns of a human being, but uh, these are really possible, and that's how they actually function. So. They do actually work with the DNA. So they had, he had two things in mind when he named it the DNA and the mRNA appliance. Uh, the ALF, again, uh, the inventor, Dr. Derek Nordstrom, uh, he uh, said both Dev Singh and Derek would be there at our conference, uh, hopefully if the corona uh, helps us out. So the ALF was mainly used in uh, pedo cases and they give amazing results. Every time we do ortho, it's uh, non-extraction. So we have uh, Dr. Steve Galela's agar uh, appliances as well. All of these involve non-invasive arch expansion. Uh, DNA and the ALF provide 3D expansion. So ALF is more useful in pediatric cases and the DNA achieves successful expansion in adults. So in the end, it's all about achieving bilaterally isotonic, which means relaxed muscle, centered bite to help the patient be as comfortable as he can. So you don't give them 70% bites, I mean protrusive bites. You don't give them night guards anymore. You find out what actually the problem could be and be more responsible as a dentist. Stop seeing yourself as just a tooth doctor, right? So remove all the causes to avoid a relapse. Teamwork is the key. You cannot work alone. Impossible. So when I came again to India, my first problem was to find the right team. No chiropractors. There were no physiotherapists who understood uh, what, uh, how uh, cervical working break. Again, I can't talk about that right now. Uh, not enough time. So my CMD, cranio-mandibular dysfunction sections are like even longer. So uh, we'll talk about that later maybe. Uh, even the physiotherapist doesn't know that a cervical uh, rotation can change the position of the jaw. Uh, we need a neurologist, you need a podiatrist to look for foot-like issues when we talked about posture. So we help sports patients. 
uh, I'm not patient, sports stars, half the Indian cricket team wears our appliances. You don't know about that. We haven't gone ahead and marketed it. Uh, a couple of uh, badminton stars, uh, a few tennis guys, an entire football team. They're all wearing our appliances because they want to function better, because their posture needs to get better. They need to breathe better. They need to sleep better. So uh, this is our uh, company and these are our centers, the right by training official pain care. We have our head office in uh, Jayanagar, Bangalore. That's our website, tmjindia.com. Our courses are the right bite courses. We do it in association with our uh, organization called the ICMO. ICMO is the International College for Craniomandibular Orthopedics. We talk about, uh, it's an it's a, uh, organization for uh, neuromuscular dentists who uh, treat uh, cranio cervical mandibular disorders, CCMD or CMD, craniofacial pain or CFP, uh, and as a dentist, uh, how to go the next one step forward. Uh, so these conferences are held every two years. We had our first one, mega success, expected like 100, 150, but we got like 350 people there. Uh, we had 10 speakers, so this time we have 15 speakers, all uh, most of them international. Uh, it was supposed to be in March, but it's now being deferred. I would use the term deferred and not postponed because it's still not sure. 25 to 27 September. Uh, even if these speakers won't be there, if they can't come, if the US is still under lockdown, if other countries are under lockdown, we would still have them on Zoom um, as a webinar, but you can come and enjoy uh, the conference. Uh, we'd also have, if they can come in, we'd have workshops on the uh, DNA appliances, on the myomunchi appliances, and on uh, how to read uh, sleep studies. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, ICMO, uh, it's an organization for the world. There are only like 800 members. Uh, we started our uh, ICMO India section uh, in 2018. Uh, and in just two years, we are now 53 members. Amazing growth. There are a lot of dentists who are joining us. So uh, if you have any doubts, ikmoindia.com. And uh, yep. Whew. I need to drink some water. So dhanyawad. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Pasibo. Shukran. Obrigado. Grazie. Matze. Thank you. Yes. I'm up for doubts. Uh, so, some uh, people are asking for the last slide. Can you just, just keep? Let me just have some water, please. <laughs> yes, sir. And I would like to tell all attendees that we do have a, a YouTube version of the same, which will be uploaded later in the day, and the link will be shared in the group. So, any part of the uh, session which you have missed, you can always go to the YouTube and watch it. Uh, which slide uh, are you talking about? I think these two slides regarding the, the conference. The, yeah, the yes, conference. conference. The prize uh, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, what, what, you should do is, what you should do is go to ikmoindia.com. Simple. It's all there. It's our website. Uh, the online registrations, payment portals, everything are there uh, on ikmo India with the, with the new dates and everything. So... Uh, we will do it, uh, maybe not in September, if it's again deferred, maybe October, now, whenever, we will be doing it, but because of the corona thing, uh, I have not been, so because of my hectic travel schedule, I've hardly, uh, I'm hardly at home, so it's the first time in like eight to ten years, uh, normally I'm at home for like two or three days, it's the first time that I've been at home for like 40 years, I mean, 40 days, so I'm really enjoying this. Thank you, Corona. I should not say that, but uh, the beard is a new thing uh, on the personal front. Yeah, any more doubts, please? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, uh, there are a lot of, I think Dr. Unni will be asking it. Yeah. Okay, Unni, so the, please. So the first question is, have you ever got a patient who has night brassism, but the sleep study when done gives normal result? What would be the etiological diagnosis good, and the treatment? Good. Good question. Absolutely good question. So uh, it depends on the uh, on the parameters you're looking for. If you are looking for uh, the just the AHI, so how do you define, how do you look for bruxism, right? You need to be looking at 
the desaturation. So if you're using the polysomnograph, which are PSGs, the sleep study level one, level two, and everything, you would see RMMA activities. If they are more than uh, more than 10 or 15, they are droxing. Uh, again, you're only 50% sure. If you're looking at PS uh, at level three studies, like the one I showed you with Westman, uh, you're looking at desaturations and uh, uh, flow, limita uh, flow limitations. They should be uh, less than 15. If they're above, yes, they may be broxing. So again, you're only 30 to 40 percent sure. Ideally, I use the GEMPRO because I want to be sure. But the GEMPRO is something that I added to my paraphernalia only like last year. So prior to that, 10 years I've been working with just the uh, PSC studies and they have proved to be very vital to me. So, because you're, it's, it's at least better than not doing anything, right? That's how I'm looking at it. I hope that has answered the question. Okay, sir. Uh, the next question is, do you use T-scan or do you believe in timed occlusion, disocclusion therapy? Whoa, okay. So, uh, it's, not, it's not in the uh, epilogue of uh, this uh, specific uh, uh, webinar. Class webinar. I'm sorry, I wasn't getting the word because I was just taken off guard here. Uh, there is a misconception about neuromuscular dentistry out there. Uh, T scan is only a diagnostic tool. Okay, uh, people people think I don't know whether it was a marketing ploy or what, but uh, T scan is not a treatment tool. You need to use different other tools to incorporate T scan as a treatment commodity with your disclusion time reduction. But then that has got nothing to do with sleep. So when a patient comes, so typically a patient comes to me with pain. Okay. CFP, craniofacial pain. And with all the diagnostic protocols that we follow, I suppose I do uh, diagnose a patient as having CMD, craniomandibular disorders, okay? Craniosovaco mandibular disorders. I relax the muscles, I check the myocentric, I find out where the jaw has to be, I give them an orthotic, and I need to correct those orthotics now. I've seen people use those locally available Vijay or even with my name, Rajesh articulation papers, which are like 140, 150 microns. That's not fair, okay? Our occlusion has the uh, proprioception levels of up to seven to eight, eight to 10 microns. The you know, thickness of a human hair. Oops, I don't have it, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, if you're going to be checking those proprioception levels with uh, uh, articulating paper, that's unfair to the patient. You're not checking the right thing. That's when, if you cannot afford a T-scan, well, you could do even good with a Bosch articulating paper, 20 microns. They are there. If you want to go one step better, so it's all about how much better do you want to do for your patients. If you want to go one step better, use the T-scan. I mean, there is also another equipment known as the occlusion. So it's not just the T-scan. So the occlusions does is occlusions is actually a, a, a digital version of the articulating paper. Okay, the T-scan is one step beyond because it actually records how much time the jaw takes to disclude from CO to disclusion, right? Incentric and canine disclusion or anterior disclusion. It, sh it should be less than 0.4 seconds. So that is done by the, uh, by the T-scan. And hence, it is important in treating CMD. But the T-scan, just as it is, it is only a diagnostic tool. So when a patient walks, I mean, if I look at 100 patients, maybe I help uh, maybe 10 to 15% of my patients with DTR. Because deep white patients, in my protocol, you can't do, you can't reduce any more teeth for a patient with deep eyes. They need to open up. So you do addition NMD and you give them orthotics. On the other hand, I use the T-scan on every patient of mine with an orthotic because I need to check for micro occlusion. So you need to be very sure as to how you want your practice to be. You'd better consult with a senior doctor. I, I'm ready to help you guys, you know, as to how you want to change your practice, what sort of equipment, 
what sort of budget you have. So you can you can chip and choose what you want. I hope that answers your question. But it's got nothing, absolutely nothing to do with your uh, sleep apnea. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, so next, is it clear for you, Pravish? Because I'm not sure if it's clear for the person who asked the question. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, okay, great, cool. Great. Now, so the next question is: uh, uh -huh. One of our patients is wearing EMA sleep. EMA. He's sleeping well, more energy, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but wakes great. up with cheek or jaw pain even after using yellow or white bands. Uh -huh. uh, band size initially. Exactly. Uh, band size exactly. 90. Initially, it was uh -huh. fine, but this uh -huh. pain started after two months of wearing. What is the cause or what uh -huh. to do? Sir, could you that, could you also that's sir, the bite registration. Sir, could you also please uh, enlighten us about this appliance EMA and regarding the yeah. Uh, so 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 like I said, there are several appliances out there. I'm not even so EMA is an elastomeric uh, mandibular appliance. It's, it's uh, there is uh, it's it's one of the mandibular advancement MAD appliances that are available out there. The appliance doesn't matter. You have to understand this. Now, that patient might be uh, waking up better. That patient might be having a better airway. So he's oxygenating better during night. His body uh, is repairing better. The cells are repairing better because there's more oxygen. So what's the best uh, uh, medicine for the human being for the human body? Oxygen the purest form of oxygen, right? And which is why the Buteyko method, the uh, art of living, uh, pranayama, uh, any meditation, any uh, breathing technique improves the human uh, mind and body because it is all about getting in oxygen. And the best oxygen, and if you get more of this at night when you sleep, that's when all the body cells are repairing. If the jaw is, if the EMA appliance or the uh, silencer or the Sornomed or the TAP or any of those appliances, it doesn't matter. It seriously doesn't matter. I used to give appliances because my patients can't afford, uh, you know, a 20, 30,000 or 40,000 rupee uh, appliance or a seven, eight lakh appliance. So, so I can't, uh, so I used to give them just customized acrylic appliances, but in the muscle body. So even if you give an EMA appliance, if that appliance wasn't a muscle-centric bite, more than, so that, you know, I would actually ask a reverse question. Was it on a 70% protrusion with a George gauge? How did you decide what should be the vertical? How did you decide whether the, there is no yaw? I mean, whether there's no yaw or roll in the mandibular position when you did do the recording? How did you decide all of this? Did you measure the muscles? Are those muscles happy? What about the neck muscles? Are they relaxed? No. That, that's why you end up... So, um, I used to have an office. I used to work in Cochin. And there is this... Uh, uh, because of my lack of time, I had to stop working there. Uh, so... There, there is a lab in the area, and we used to get a lot of patients with CMD, sorry, with CMD, because of these appliances not being given in the right body. Imagine, believe it or not. So, which is why I said that study that came uh, came out like uh, a month ago, and my friend wrote that study, uh, Dr. Supriya, or Supriya. So, she, uh, when she mentioned that mandible appliances create uh, CMD, it's because of this. You're not recording it at the right muscle body. It has to be very important. Everyone has to understand this. We as dentists should not be putting down ourselves even more. We need to understand how important muscles are in the concept of occlusion and jaw position and keep ourselves up there. Is that clear? It's all about the body. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. muscle-centric body. Yeah. Muscle-centric body. Bam! Okay, sir. The next question is, what is your take on the correlation of OSA with chronic fatigue syndrome and other MSK disorders? Harneet Singh, Dr. Harneet Singh. Yeah, so uh, if there is uh, sleep apnea, like I said, it's not all sleep apnea patients have bruxism or all sleep apnea 
high AHI cases, not all of them have uh, desaturations, okay? So it all depends on the sleep study. So which is why we need to quantify it. We need to be sure. So we make sure that we do the sleep study and we find out whether the patient is clenching or not. So most of these morning headache cases, they end up as migraines because none of the doctors understand why those. So for example, when a patient has a headache, or uh, constant headaches in the morning when they wake up, they go to a doctor and an ENT or a neurologist. They try different drugs. One drug doesn't work. The next drug, the next drug doesn't work because they're not getting to the cause of the problem, which is the uh, clenching. All they would give are tabs. And once these tabs don't work, okay, you have migraine. So that's, hap that's what happens with uh, wrong diagnosis, faulty diagnosis. Again, the term that was used, uh, musculoskeletal pain dysfunction. There is myofacial pain dysfunction. There is, uh, you know, uh, our myalgias. There is, uh, so there are so many terms that are myositis. There are so many terms that have been given because a doctor is not able to actually diagnose. My okay. diagnosis would be the whole thing. It would be CFP, craniofacial pain. The, it's part of the dentist's job to take care of finding the diagnosis, finding what is actually causing the problem. More often than not, it is sleep apnea-related bruxism, for which you need to follow these protocols that I did mention right now. Okay, okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, do you think that all patients with snoring needs to be assessed for airway obstruction? It has to be airway obstruction. Absolutely, absolutely. Good question. <laughs> In my experience, when, a, when patients come to me uh, and you ask them, do you snore? Most of them are like, a little hardly. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. Snoring is caused because of a posterior placement of the tongue. So you saw in that video how the tongue goes back. So when the tongue goes back, it hits the uvula, the small tongue that hangs below. So with patients with malamparty three or four, where you can't see the uvula at all, it is understandable that when you go to sleep, both gravity and the jaw position is going to push the jaw back and the tongue is going to hit the uvula. So sometimes, the, uh, so it's the tongue hitting the uvula that actually creates a snoring sound. Yeah. So it could be as light as, or it could be heard across uh, buildings and you know. So that's also so both are snoring. It doesn't mean the uh, the uh, the former guys are not snoring. They are snoring. The former section they are also snoring, no matter what. Is that snoring habitual or is it pathological? That's what needs to be asserted. And only with a sleep study, along with other diagnostic protocols that we talked about today, can you decide whether uh, that snoring is dangerous or not. So if you do a sleep study and you find the AHS are high, bam, that's pathological. Uh, if it's not, it's just a habitual snoring. If you are the spouse, then and that's and you're getting disturbed. Well, give them a sleep appliance, but it's not going to uh, hurt that person health-wise. Uh, but if that person is pathologic with that snoring, then it's going to hurt them health-wise. There's a study that shows 20, 25 years of snoring is going to uh, will end up with cardiac problems. So again, 80% of all that snoring could be uh, pathologic. So we need to do a sleep study to ascertain whether it's habitual or pathologic. Another example, um, when, so I have a drink uh, once in a while. When I drink more than normal, more than often, more than the normal amount, I snore like crazy. So I travel with the sleep appliance because when I'm tired or when I like go beyond the drinks, I wear the appliance because I need to be functioning the next day. I need to, uh, like that question also involved awareness. If your sleep is getting broken and you're not having enough REM sleep, 25% REM sleep, that sleep was carried over to the next day. So it affects your functioning, your quality. You're not going to be attentive enough. So uh, I want to be functioning at my peak. So I wear a sleep appliance when I'm traveling and when I'm drinking. So cheers. <laughs> next. <laughs> right, sir. So uh, 
whether it is snoring or to know the etiology of bruxism you need uh, sleep study yeah, that is absolutely. that is how we can diagnose all that yeah right sir uh, now the next question is after you take a myocentric bite how long should the patient wear the appliance and would you be giving the same bite to your restorations oh Good point. No, uh, absolutely not. The sleep appliance is only for the sleep. So there is uh, there are uh, there's a group of doctors who are against dentists. So uh, again, okay, let me get to the uh, the economics and what's happening with the sleep medicine politics in India. Um, doctors are scared. Uh, right now, sleep medicine is covered by uh, neurologists, ENTs, uh, pulmonologists, and they are into CPAP units and uh, surgical procedures when most of these patients, they, all they need is a sleep appliance. Uh, actually, when you do a sleep study, uh, the companies, ResMed and Philips, when they do that sleep study for you, so I, uh, when, before I got my jam pro, I, we used to outsource them to these companies. Uh, if the patient has an AHI of 15, that comes with mild and they don't need to do anything. Absolutely not. The reason why the right mild is because their way of treatment, which is surgery and uh, CPAP, they are, they aren't as uh, you know functional with smaller AHI values. So that's where we dentists come into play, and we need to be providing these sleep appliances only during night. So there are a group of people that say uh, these sleep appliances uh, change the position of the jaw permanently. Absolutely not. Because you wear it only at night, and that too with the muscle-centric bite, not in a force bite. You wear it in a force bite, yes, there is a chance of changing the bar and the jaw position permanently. But if it's in a muscle-centric bite, it's not going to change because you're going to be wear, uh, chewing. Your jaw is not moving at night. It is to stop the movement of the jaw that you're wearing the sleep, the muscle-centric sleep appliance. In the daytime, when you remove, you're going to be chewing, you're going to be talking, you're going to be swallowing when it goes into maximum MIP. The only time it goes into MIP. So. When all that happens, the jaw position is going to be regained again in max three to four minutes. Some doctors provide the jigs. I don't even do that. By the time you finish brushing, it's fine. Because ours are muscle-centric bites. So uh, we don't need to be bothered about that. Okay, right. So you told, told us about the DNA appliance in adult patients and how it can affect the uh, arch expansion and all that. How do you yep. stabilize the, that arch, expanded arch? Oh, ever since I've got into uh, neuromuscular dentistry, I've stopped giving uh, retention appliances. Uh, well, uh, Pravish, I think we are getting into uh, the pain <laughs> side of it, but I don't mind talking, yeah. I'm free. So, uh, when, why has it, why has it become a part of orthodontic protocol uh, you know, why has the uh, fixed retention appliances become a part and parcel of orthodontic protocol? Why? Because prior to treatment, we aren't taking care of the airway. We are not looking at how the airway is. We are not looking at the other causes. We are not looking at the posture. We are, not, are you looking for a short foot? <laughs> why should a dentist be looking for a short foot, right? But these are the small things that, you know, it hardly takes two minutes of your time. That's what we do. We check every patient for all of this. And ever since I've been doing that, I have not delivered even one retention appliance to any of our orthodontic patients. You don't have to. You don't even have after, to. It's, even after you're giving the DNA appliance in an adult patient. Exactly. Even DNA. So what, what so why, why is, what's happening? What is the problem actually? It's the constricted arch. There's no tongue. So the tongue, no one understands the uh, value of the tongue as a muscle there. The tongue is a huge muscle. It's so strong. It's so powerful that it extends forces on the teeth that are beyond our control. So you need to make space for it. You need to uh, uh, get mandibular freedom. You need to expand the jaw. I'm not saying do all cases, not especially now you could... Uh, change. I mean, you could go by anthropological uh, uh, studies. Okay, so North Indian facial structure is different from South Indian. We Dravidians have a more bimax structure. So yes, you should do. You could maybe do an extraction orthodontic case, but always end it with a expansion. 
not finish extraction and give a fixed retention and leave the patient to And why are we talking about just orthodontics? We can prosthodontics. I've seen a lot of cases where, you know, an across the arch uh, bridge has been given. There's going to be so much cranial strain. For some of the patients, we just had to cut across through the center and pain is off by at least 50, 60 plus. So these are small things that we need to be aware of when you're treating our patients. So regarding the DNA appliance, uh -huh. uh, is it even for adults or only for pediatric? It's for adults also. Uh, it's, no, no, it's not just adults. It depends on the case. It depends on the payment capacity because it's a little more expensive than the ALF. Uh, the DNA is faster. Uh, the ALF is slower. So there are, there are, there are one orthodontist had asked that whether the arch expansion, how, how good is it, arch with uh, which you get out of oh, DNA? It's amazing. Okay, so uh, yeah. if you go to uh, the website of Vivo's, uh, it's actually uh, Vivo's website, you will get a lot of research material that uh, shows you uh, about the DNA appliance and the mRNA and uh, ALF and everything. And so, how long does it uh, take? Uh, the DNA appliance in adults, normally a year and a half. Uh, but I've seen uh, results uh, in like uh, six months, eight months. The remaining time is for uh, kind of a stabilizing time to hold it in place. And once the uh, bone osteogenic activity has been completed, uh, you can remove them. They don't need any other appliance after that. Finished. Simple. Yeah. Right. And uh, the ALF in kids would take a year, a year and a half easily. Yes. So for uh, twin block therapy, do we, do they, for children, do they also need to have the muscle activity recorded? Yes, exactly. So uh, my, uh, I have this young, uh, very energetic orthodontist who's in my team in uh, Trivandrum at Kim's Hospital. Uh, I have a, 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 what do you say, attachment there as well. So uh, he was telling me that I've been doing a lot of uh, twin blocks, so, but, but I'm not sure where the bite is. There you go. Why don't you do those twin blocks in the myocentric bite, in the muscle specified bite? You get better results. You know where exactly the jaw has to be. You're anticipating the jaw position. You know that this kid has to grow to this level, right? You don't need to be going to arbitrary points. So, amazing question. Yes, it has, if possible, yes, triangles, everything. Bring it to, uh, and now, with uh, actually with, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Insignia. It's uh, an Onco product, Damon. It, they, uh, they are actually customized Damon brackets. Dr. Gurkir, a good friend of mine, he uh, lectures a lot about them. So uh, I think- uh, He's one of our attendees, sir. Yes, sir. He's one of our oh, attendees here. Uh, oh, Gurkir is here. Hi, Gurkir. So uh, you, you should ask, actually shoot those questions uh, about uh, insignia straight to him. He would uh, explain it better. Anything else? Right. Then, so how will you diagnose bruxism in patients with an abrasion, with abrasion in normal dental clinic setup? Uh, yeah. Normal. So again, it's uh, so every dental clinic is normal. It's up to the doctor to decide whether you need to go to the next step or not. So. Uh, like I showed my first slide, where you see the, show me the money, the money pouring in, you know. So when the money is pouring in, basically when you see a patient with totally arthritic teeth, you're like, wow, in comes a 28 unit ceramic case. Amazing. Right? So you see abrasions there. What would you do? You would give crowns, you would fill those uh, scooped out enamel teeth, you would uh, fill those uh, abfractions. Uh, but you forget to ask yourself, why did they form in the first place? So most of those attritions and abstractions are caused due to... So the next question, instead of telling the patient, oh, these we can fill, instead of telling that, the next question is, do you snore? Or how do you sleep? So the patient is going to give you an odd look, surely, because he's like, why is the dentist asking me this question? Right? Well, that's what a dentist should be asking. The dentist should be asking that question. And we need to change that outlook of patients towards us. So ask the question, do you snore? Tell them yes. the problems yes. with 
uh, sleep apnea. Tell them that you can die. Scare them. Okay. Yeah, I can take care of the tooth, but if you do it uh, with the sleep appliance, better. If not, this can wear away soon again. That's all you need to be telling the patient that it's going to relapse. That problem is going to it's going to wear away again if you do not wear a sleep appliance. So, is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Pravish, any questions from your side? Wow, there's a lot of questions. How much time will we have? Sir, there's a question on T scan. How much does it cost? <laughs> okay, so uh, so there are two occlusal, uh, you know, uh, checking uh, uh, they, 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 are, they had asked like cost, uses, and significance of T scan. Ha! Huh. So this is the problem, right? Why is everyone so T scan centric? Anyway, uh, I have a T scan at all my centers, but I also have an occlusion. It's because of the sheer number of patients. So we need both working in tandem. Uh, I use a T-scan only for my DTR patients uh, because you can connect it with the bio-EMG and find out the muscle uh, along to do my DTR. Uh, the T-scan, uh, there are two versions available. The older version is, I think, for uh, six and a half and the newer one is for eight and a half. Uh, the occlusions is available at uh, one and a half. So it all depends as to what your outlook is. Uh, we do our courses uh, once and twice a year. Uh, we explain to the patient, I mean, to our uh, participants, when to use which, what protocols need to be followed, uh, the right bite protocol, addition NMD, reduction NMD, DTR, uh, sleep, posture, sport. So all this is taught about in our five-day course uh, uh, that leads to uh, your fellowship program. Uh, so maybe for further information, why don't you do one thing? If you have any more doubts, but Pricing, uh, I don't deem it right as a, a speaker to be talking about the economics. I think you should be talking to my uh, to uh, our executive director of ICMO India, uh, Dr. Aishwarya. She could help you with all of that because we have special prices for all these companies have tagged along with us for special prices for ICMO India members. So maybe you could uh, contact her and get further information. ICMOindia.com, please. Our email ID is there. Please shoot your doubts there. Right. I'm just being very ethical. I, I, I think that's all from my side. Uh, any yeah. more from yours, Uni? Uh, no. How was body posture related to sleep apnea? I mean, so. Oh, yes. Know. Yeah, good question. So, uh, when you're looking at sleep apnea, most of these sleep apnea patients would have a, a forward head posture. Okay. The reason is most of the sleep apnea patients have a small uh, airway. So the body is virtually trying to repair itself. It's a physiological response by the body, telling the head to move a little forward so that the airway opens up. So when the head moves forward, there is going to be some change in the yaw pitch and roll of your jaw. Okay, And if that change happens, there's going to be a change in your cervical vertebral position as well. And that would lead to change in your body posture, your shoulder position, your hip position, all to compensate. So we have patients uh, with leg pain, with feet, uh, with their uh, pain in the toe caused due to TMD. So it's, uh, it's all about your diagnosis and how you uh, get to that. Is there any, any book which you would like to recommend to read about uh, yeah, I mean, there is, uh, there's no specific, so our, uh, it's, it's, again, uh, I don't want to be sounding so damning about it, but our dependence on textbooks is, uh, what the problem is, uh, neuromuscular dentistry is more about new research, so if you can get your hands on new research papers, again, ICMO India has all of them, uh, but there is a textbook, uh, by, uh, Jankelson, uh, so it's known as Jankelson's textbook of neuromuscular dentistry. Uh, there is Robert Kirstein's uh, book on uh, occlusion for T-scan and DTR. Uh, there is uh, Robert uh, Kirsten, sorry, and there's Robert Jankelson's textbook on airway. Uh, 
there are a few textbooks, I mean books out there. I wouldn't call them textbooks. There are books out there. Uh, but it's more about getting up, being up to date with uh, research papers. Okay. Yeah. Again, if you have, uh, I, I could, I, I will sh uh, uh, message all these students, the groups, the WhatsApp groups are available. I'll be messaging all of these details so that you can uh, check them out online. Yes. So good. Gurkirat sir is online. I don't know if he can hear us. Uh, if he would like. Hey, Gurkirat. Yes. Hi, 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 Ravindran. Good to see you and uh, very informative uh, talk. Thank you. How are you? Long all time. good. <laughs> yeah, we are all stuck in our homes, and I sincerely hope that uh, everybody <laughs> stays home and stays safe. Yeah, but uh, uh, but thanks to these webinar sessions, you know, everyone's kind of busy. So. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to technology, right? <laughs> yep. Good. Great uh, seeing you. You're in Delhi, Gurkreet, or uh, somewhere else? Very much. Very much in Delhi. Very much in Delhi. Okay. Uh, I know Delhi is supposed to be my next stop, uh, but I don't know when that's happening. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> just whenever you are in town, just uh, give me a buzz. Yeah, yeah. Of course, surely not. Cheers to that. Cheers, boy. Thank you. Right, sir. That's animation? that's about it, sir. Next, uh, okay. we'll move on to the next phase. Uh, there will be a, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you, IDM Malibar. Uh, oh, sorry, IDM uh, Malibar. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to spread the word of uh, neuromuscular dentistry. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, your president, uh, Dr. Shaju. Uh, is he here now? Yes, sir. He's, he's, here. Uh, he's here. He wants to. Oh, hi, hi, Dr. Shaji. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. He's Manjali, online. Secretary, uh, and uh, your CD convener and Dr. Pravish. Uh, and Dr. CD convener is Unikrishna. I am the. Pravish, uh, the, yeah. uh, the guy who organized all of this. Thank you very much. And I hope I was of help to you guys. And uh, uh, keep in touch. I am very. Uh, uh, you know, uh, active on all social media, so you can uh, shoot me doubts and questions whenever you have it. Thank you again. Bye. Uh, uh, Shadu, sir, would like to say a few words. Okay, okay, okay. okay. All right. I came a little bit late. That's why I couldn't talk to you in the beginning. No, that's okay. No problem. As long as you join. <laughs> okay, okay. I think this is the first CD program to send them different from other routine subjects. <laughs> well, as I look at it, it has to be different. <laughs> I always be, believe in uh, being different. And my special appreciation to the project for of course, which I such a different knowledge class, and of course, this school is perfect. And I'm very grateful to you, for the only, for the project, for the efforts in organizing the project. And finally, on behalf of Avinia Malva, I sincerely thank Thank you all the participants and thank you all. Thank you. See you. And yeah. Uh, bye bye. Thank you all. See you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, sir, there was Dr. Sweedu, sir, who said hi in the beginning. I'm not sure whether he is online now. Oh, Sedu, he's my uh, super senior from college. Sedu Sivshankar. Yeah. I'm not sure whether he's available now. Yeah, he is here. He is here. He is here. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Sedu. Hi, hi. <laughs> he had, uh, Sedu had uh, helped me, uh, helped organize uh, a lecture by me, I think, uh, two or three years ago at, uh, in Calicut, uh, at Uber, uh, doing that presentation. Two years, three years back. Two years, three years back in uh, at Ravi's. So, uh, uh, thank you, thanks, Edu, for that uh, opportunity. Uh, so, listen, you know what? I see, uh, Pravish, I see a lot of questions on the uh, chat box and that, the question that, answer that, section. That being uh, dealt already, I believe. No, no, no. There are so many uh, very uh, valid questions. I, what I want you to do is, you know, number these questions, and you know, I will uh, the ones that I have not answered. I'll just number them and answer again. I'd love to answer them, so I just want to answer everyone's questions. Yeah, there, there are a few, there are a few. I could, I could do that on the group. So just copy-paste them onto the uh, WhatsApp group and uh, I'll just uh, 
Yeah, I, I've done that, sir. Nine oh, of them sorry, are unanswered. I've copied okay. it. Okay, great. Cool. Thank you. So, okay, all sir, attendees, thank you. I guess. this will thank be you. available on the YouTube. And uh, there's an e-certificate for all the attendees. Uh, I've given the instructions in our group. And uh, the YouTube link also will be shared in the group. Thank you. Thank you, Raj Rajesh, sir. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.